Welcome, friends, to the Regeneration Podcast. Um, good evening, I'm going to say, because tonight, uh, recording in an evening, it's a Thursday, uh, sorry, it's a Tuesday evening before Thanksgiving. And for those who are watching on YouTube, they might recognize my guest, uh, our guest, David Cayley. And David, uh, Michael Martin's, uh, I think he's out doing something related to the farm, and he's going to join us in a few minutes. Let me let me tell you, David, that um, my first experience interviewing anybody about anything was when I wrote an article on uh, about your book on Ivan Illich, and I reviewed um, your biography, and uh, and I just I put a lot of heart and soul into that, and I just knew that so much do I regard. Uh, Ivan Illich, uh, that I just had to supplement it with something else. I had to, yeah. and it was uh, it was from no attempt to break into a world of podcasting. There was no part of me that just really wanted to do something online. It just felt like an act of necessity to talk with you, so that the readers of Front Porch Republic could get even a fuller picture. And um, I can't thank you enough for that. I can't thank you enough for conversations we had in the interim. How are you doing, my friend? I'm fine. I don't think you ever told me that. And yeah. um, that was such a good interview. We had My such, tech, the technology was pretty rocky a, on my part. Well, but we had such a good rapport. and it, We did, we did. Yeah. So I, I'm uh, I'm pleased to hear that was your first venture. Yeah. Yeah, it was um, really, it was fun. That's, a, that's quite an honor. Yeah. So tonight we're going to, and I want you to bring up things that interest you, but um, I wrote to you a few weeks ago, and I recommended, and our, our regular listeners would know only um, by some name dropping, because I haven't gone into him, and tonight is not about the person of Christo Chianaros, but I said to you, like, this name, because um, throughout your writings, um, and we're going to mention uh, your website and everything, you've been one of these people who, like maybe a Bill Kavanaugh and some others, have found it useful to question the whole notion or maybe to recategorize in a more appropriate place, and sometimes I might even say like a smaller place, the notion of this thing called religion, you know? And I think, you know, I'd been writing, I'd been reading Bill Kavanaugh, and our listeners, we had him on the show, but we didn't talk about this. Um, but on your blog years ago, you mentioned the name William Cantwell Smith, and you just had such clear language about like the idea of religion. You know, why don't you just kind of like entertain our listeners a little bit? Because we're going to talk about this. We're going to take a, something of a deep dive. Tell people about your entrance point to questioning, you know, what would you call it? The heuristic, the framing, the concept of religion. Wow. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you from the bottom of my heart for the introduction to Christos Yanaras. I don't know if oh, that's really? how you, one should I, properly I, say his name. And when I looked yeah. him up, I discovered that he had died. Yeah, just recently. In the summer, in August, yep. I think. Yep. The Some book, good news for uh, our Catholic talking listeners. About, is, oh, go ahead. Yep. The book we're talking about is called Against Religion. Mike recommended it to me. I I found it tremendous. Oh, um, good. Uh, and in scores of ways, but wow. very much relating to Ivan Illich hmm. uh, and seemingly no knowledge of one another whatsoever. He doesn't mention Illich. I don't remember Illich ever mentioning him. Uh, and yet uh, so much of what he calls religionization of the church is what Ivan calls corruption of yeah. the church. Right? And so that's that's the first thing I want to thank you for that. We can yeah. go into Yanaris as as you wish. Otherwise, and you're going to love the whole corpus. The, it's wide. Yeah, like Illich. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the framing of your question. Otherwise, um, a, about three different uh, starting points um, suggested themselves to me as you asked that question. So. I'll, Start off the top of my head, um, please, with a, a sermon that I heard um, when I was probably about nine years old. It was preached in, in the chapel of Trinity College School, where my father was a master, and 
the text was Paul's letter in which he advises, I think it's the Thessalonians, to pray ceaselessly, to mm. pray unceasingly sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, so I was inspired by the sermon, and the next day I went by myself, quietly hoping to be unobserved, to the chapel when, no, when I thought no one would be there to begin my career of praying unceasingly. <laughs> and just as I was getting settled in a pew, the, the, um, the organ master came into practice, and I was so mortified uh, that I hid under the pew because really I, I was shy and I, I didn't want to be discovered. And How so, old were you, David? I, I would say I was about nine. Okay, younger than and, okay, yeah. and so having come in up to crawl under the pew, I couldn't really come out till he, till he had finished. <laughs> and needless to say, I did not pray uh, yeah. in that, the posture. Um, yep. So that's to say, I was a devout youth who aspired yeah. to be a Christian, and I can remember it overhearing my father tell someone that yes we we think he'll be a minister when he grows up wow yep. and and yet i didn't become a minister and i increasingly did not know how to understand um the christian church or to participate in it uh, mm -hmm. so that's been a lifelong to, uh, to tell you another story uh yeah a, a, a lifelong in and out back and forth but you know, now i'm a young man and i've joined a little congregation in vancouver where i was living and working for the cbc i came home one day after church and my wife said um how come you're always in a worse mood when you come home from church than when you go <laughs> i think that defines a lot of people i think it defines a lot of and people i thought that was a, a one of the most splendid questions I've ever been asked, because it was artless. I, I don't think she was, um, she genuinely wanted to know. And so I had artless. to try and answer. And I thought, well, it's because I argue with it the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. I, I argue with the creed. I ask, what does this mean? What what is, what is right? So I guess you, you could say that I I, uh, I was trying to deal with a exhausted, for me, a symbolic language, which still moved me deeply, which I understood and yet didn't understand. So I think my situation is not different than so many people's sure, sure. situation. I may have been more motivated to keep trying. Mm -hmm. Um. So Very there, there's a question of re religion posed in my life. Now, you mentioned Cantwell Smith. That was a discovery much later that this object, religion, has history. Right? That it, Which it, is different than most people think. That yeah. It isn't what, it isn't always the same thing. Uh, and so what Cantwell Smith said and various other writers have said the same, was that the idea of a religion as we understand it um, really appears um, only in modern times, right? That, it, mm -hmm. that as a, a, a bounded system of belief segregated from living in some way or set apart from the ordinary business of living, so the emergence of a of a secular space, which is understood to be somehow different than the religious space, is is a modern invention. So that for me was a solacing idea because I I I began to see that I didn't really understand. I didn't understand this thing. So mm -hmm. the position I probably came to, this is before reading Yanaris, is that Religion is innate, as he says, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's, he even uses the word instinctive. Uh, I don't know if instinctive goes a little too far because if it's a, if it's a, if it appears with consciousness, 
then we would tend to contrast instinct with with the ideas we form once we become conscious but leave that aside he says it's innate and but one one little thing on that is because maybe it might be somewhat important and i'll just use one example and i'm not trying to say this is instinctive but when i'm talking about this with people david i i'm kind of saying religion is you know in a healthy amount it seems fun you know like when kids jump over the cracks on the sidewalk when they go right. to the that it would you call that instinctive maybe you know that we some space is unlike other space some time is unlike other time. I have an atheist um, father-in-law, and yet he celebrates his quarter birthday, his half birthday, and his birthday. And I would say he's much more religious than I am, but he's an atheist. You know, these are right. different. Does that resonate yes. with you? Well, it's okay. certainly, yes, because it certainly has that meaning, right? We would yeah. say he's a bit religious about his how he prepares his coffee. Mm -hmm. and, and that remark would be understood by most people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's whatever takes... A repeating form and then becomes somewhat hallowed by repetition we yeah. would call that religious mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i like carl bart's language where he says at one point that it's a yoke mm. it's, it's it's a structure in which we're harnessed but probably the idea that came to me while interviewing charles taylor is is has stayed with me which is that it's it's inherent in being conscious. Okay. One asks, one reaches for a dialogue. How where did this come from? What what is this? How there there must be another conscious interlocutor who is not me and not you, not others like me. In other words, it yeah, that that it is a, a dialogue with the source of the consciousness, the, the reason for being conscious. It seems to me somewhat inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we, yes, that says we're religious by definition, in the sense mm -hmm. that we, now that's quite different than the 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 religion of coffee or the religion of not stepping on the crack but it is right right it is another dimension of the word is that we must whether we're a theist or an atheist uh, whatever our conceptions we must yeah yeah somehow be in in conversation with the source of meaning mm -hmm. uh, we we may doubt it we may be angry with it we may uh deny it but we the posture will be there just the same it's it's structured yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's built in to who we mm -hmm. are yeah and do you think it you i think you kind of you've taken some deeper dives into mercia eliad over the years maybe to come to terms with some of your guests at your let's take a let's just name it uh david kelly again ladies and gentlemen uh produced the best body of work of anybody in any media in the last 30 years at the CBC, his ideas program. And you're going to go to his uh, website, davidkayley.com and uh, discover his, his, you know, he already mentioned he's talked with Charles Taylor. He's done the best things on Simone Weil, of course, Yvonne Illich, great stuff on Rene Girard. But if we talked and there's more, but um, this notion, I think that for Eliade, because I don't know if it wasn't from him, who else I got it from. But when I was thinking about my father-in-law, some space is unlike other space and some time is unlike other time. How far does that yeah. carry you? And does that sound like it came from Eliade? Eliade is, is certainly yeah. one of the best people you can read if you want to understand yeah. sacred and profane. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's in Durkheim. I think it's the idea is there before okay, right. him, but he, yeah. he develops it. Uh, very brilliantly and I, I think it's true and I mean for me there the the decisive influence was René Girard mm. that, in showing how the sacred is made right? okay that it is mm -hmm. I mean, now some people will use the word sacred as a synonym for religion or a synonym for the divine 
but I think it's better to use it more precisely in the way Girard shows you that sacrifice makes the sacred, right? Mm -hmm. literally something. Can you describe that little? We've never done, you might be shocked to know, we've never done a whole episode on Girard. Could you sketch out, uh, well, even for our listeners on that? I can try. I, I mean, René Girard, <clears throat> after an initial book, which came into English as Deceit, Desire, and the Novel, uh, claimed that in the novel, you, as he analyzed it, he was a literary critic initially, you see the primacy of mim what he called mimesis, imitation, uh, for human beings, that our desire, our, our most fundamental desires, that we would even call them instincts sometimes, are copied from one another. Mm -hmm. And the copying uh, puts us into various situations of rivalry and competition with, with one another. So he took a second step in a book called Violence and the Sacred, um, in which he supposed that if imitation is our nature, and it's the reason we can, I mean, the miracle of a child learning to speak, whatever grammar may be innate, you know, whatever basic structures are given still, an inarticulate child within a, a year to mm -hmm. two years learns the English language most. Mm -hmm. How is it possible? Right. Imitation, right? Imitation. We copy. Um, it's the same way, you know, music, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so Girard then goes back and begins to try and imagine using mythology as his guide the earliest communities, and he imagines that they must have been constantly roiled by the competition that is created by imitation, and that they would again and again have hit on the same mechanism for restoring peace. And that mechanism would have been one against all. Identify the malefactor, mm -hmm. kill the malefactor, Name him as a contagion or peace, something. Peace is restored. And then the malefactor is a benefactor. He's actually the source of the peace. She, he or she. So mm -hmm. the, the the that for him, I mean, I'm, that's pretty brutally simplified, yeah, is, yeah. The, is the origin of sacrifice, the origin of religion, and the origin of culture. Mm -hmm. Um, so a sacred is made. That's the key element, yeah. right? It, it's uh -huh. where whoever wants to set something aside to make it untouchable will say that it's sacred and that's, you may not touch it. It's been taken out of use. It's been taken out of conversation. You may not address in any way what I proclaim. That's well said, yeah. As what I proclaim as sacred. So um, that's an element of religion. It's mm -hmm. thought of as an element of religion, but I think it's a, it's a, it's just a human, it's just a human operation. Yeah. So. So where, where do you, you know, laying, and I'm not saying we've done this comprehensively because it would take it so long, and I think we're going to continue to to build some of the building blocks because it's um like i personally just wanted to talk to you you know you've read yanaros why i think this is becoming an increasingly important question in our time is that something you concur with david like the I what is the most important i would say it's the okay. most important question riff on that for a little while okay well what does ivan Illich say, let's start with him and then come to Yanaros, right? Mm -hmm. Illich says that the misunderstanding of the gospel, the misprision, the corruption and perversion language he also uses, 
uh, produces the modern world. That is, the modern world comes out of the institutionalization of the fundamental idea of the incarnation. The, the God is present with us is the, is the idea of the incarnation, right? Now God can be known and loved in person, right? Mm -hmm. I can see God in you. You can see God in me. Um, it's it's a, a fundamentally new beginning. Right. Uh, it's a it's a a moment in religious history when basically the whole polarity of religion is is reversed. Right. Uh, I like that way. Uh, of David it. Martin. David Martin who was a British theologian and an Anglican priest, uh, a British sociologist of religion, a brilliant man who I liked very much. Um, he, in a book called The Breaking of the Image, he, he compares it to a nuclear explosion. Mm. So religion undergoes <laughs> a nuclear explosion. It's, <laughs> it's, it blows up. It's distributed. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh -huh. um, so, but it reconsolidated other, and how, but we'll get yeah, to that. Yeah. Other other people have different images. Um uh but fundamentally what happened now Girard to go to him also says this is not a religious event. This is this is the undoing of the religious mechanism insofar as it was as it was a sacrificial idea, right? This sacrifice has ended sacrifice, right? Which leads mm -hmm. Gerard then sure. to say that society has become uh, naked, unprotected in a certain way because it has lost its, its quite effective and efficient religious mechanism. Mm -hmm. We turn... And we for turn some reason, I almost want to do a little parenthetical here as our listeners are... You know, I, I have these conversations with people, Dave, and it makes them very nervous, especially in an anxious culture where religious behavior is keeping a lot of people, even if it's an overlap with a condition known as obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, people are kind of holding on to these types of behaviors now because the world is going kind of crazy. But yes. I want to let people know, you know, that where we're going in my own life categories of religion has made things like the incarnation, you know, just explode with a reality you know um yeah. that like that christ becomes um christ becomes more the alpha and the omega to me the more that i can keep religion in context if that makes sense and that was just kind of me like maybe welcoming some people who are following us this far wondering if we're just trying to take down the whole show um but i just had that you know little interjection you know to um, and, and you might tie that in only if only if you resonate with that, you know, on how it blew everything up, blew everything up. Well, I mean, the continuation of the story then yeah. is the institutionalization of Christianity. And here Unaris comes in, right? He mm -hmm. believes that something he what he speaks of. This is again is Gianas Unaris. Um Yep. Uh, Chris, Christos Yanaros. Christos Yanaros? So, yeah, Yanaros. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who, um, whose book Against Religion um, Mike introduced me to. So he he speaks of something that he calls the ecclesial event. Right? I love Which it. Which is quite beautiful and like what Illich calls conspiratio. So the the meeting the meeting around a table, the communion of those who have recognized that this event has occurred and who recognize that a new possibility exists. And it's essentially to pass beyond themselves into a community, into a body as the church understood it. So literally every young person is hungry for in our time. Yeah, but that it is essentially 
a stepping outside oneself, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a relation, right? And he has a he has a wonderful a pass, passage, a, a, almost a frightening passage, but um, uh, I'm loving this so much that you uh, just took to Yonaro so well. Okay, so the, the renunciation, he says, so the giving up of oneself uh, as primary. The renunciation is experienced as a mind reeling void, as total wow. despair. It nevertheless proves to be a presupposition if we are to free ourselves from our ego, our nature, and give ourselves up without any reservation to the relation of love, wow. to faith, mm -hmm. to trust. So that seems to be the possibility that was present in the life of Jesus of Nazareth and that was continued by those who experienced him, whether they experienced him as a resurrected Lord or they took the word of another because faith, trust is, is hugely important in this story, that it's not, it's, this is not so far a religion. Mm -hmm. It's a relation. And he makes the point that it's religion is still it's going on. In it's a happening. Yeah. Yep. yeah? Yep. An event. Yeah. Yep. But it's not a religion, but it it becomes religionized. Now, if you accept Yonaris' story that it's religion is innate in us and instinctive in us, it must become religionized in the same way that Ivan recognizes that Christianity, well, he doesn't say must, is very likely mm -hmm. to become institutionalized to become corrupted in that sense, to develop a class of priests uh, and functionaries who control and administer the religion, who, who produce it on command, who uh, are in charge of the theatrical performances that it seems to require. So the Yonaris is, is wonderfully radical, Mike, right? <laughs> Again, but I'm he, loving this so much. He's <laughs> quite tart about the theater of the church, uh, uh -huh. right? Which and yet he goes, he loves about, reminding. He our might listeners. be solemn. Yeah, yeah. He might be solemn about that. The beauty yeah. of the ritual, yeah, yeah. the glory of the vestments, the beauty of the song. Mm -hmm. He's not unmindful of it, but he never mistakes it for the actual event of being in communion. Yeah. Yeah. Right? of mm -hmm. passing outside oneself and of recognizing that the truth is not in me as some sort of interiority that I can plumb, right? That's all I need to do, right? I have all these aids, tutelary aids that are given to me. I, I eat the communion wafer, which he uh, at one point says, can become a sacralized fetish object. Uh -huh. I mean, that's, if you suffered, as I related, you know, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the boy, take the boy hiding under the pew as an image uh -huh. uh, of, of an ambivalent relation yeah. uh, for the young man who comes home from church angrier than he went. Mm -hmm. um, to, to ha but yet who yearns towards this, what seems to be unreachable past, right? Uh, I have a portrait of my great grandfather who is rector of a church here in Toronto and a professor of theology at the university. You know, a, a, he's, re he's reading a prayer book in this portrait. You know, and I look at him and I, I think he was a troubled man also, but yet there's an image there of how one ought to be, of what, of, of the, the piety that I can't quite reach mm -hmm. ought to look like. So yeah, Yanaris is really interesting about this. Uh, yeah. How how hard he is on religionization, or how direct and blunt he is about it. But he's 
he's essentially saying, and what he's, he's, I mean, Illich recognizes that as soon as um, the church takes on administrative responsibilities and legal, uh, you know, the bishops become magistrates, which is in the time of Theodosius, I think, not long after Constantine, um, you already have the rudiments of an administrative church. But, he, but Ivan leaned most heavily on the, the period in the 12th century where he felt he really, you know, the period the emergence of what's sometimes called the papal revolution, mm -hmm. the emergence of papal monarchy and so on. But Yanaris sets a lot of these things back into earlier councils, into earlier times. And the Franks have a huge role for him, right? Yeah, he's 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 a little snooty about the Franks. Yeah. But, you yeah. Know, the Greek the Greek uh, obviously, uh, Hellenism was the matrix for a proper understanding of Christianity, and then these these primitives come on the scene, and mm -hmm. a great deal of religionization for him is explained as the only way of mediating uh, the gospel to these savages. So, yeah. so, you know, if your ancestry is Frankish or German, you may... You may, you may, you may, uh, a little bit, uh, <laughs> you know, he can be pretty harsh about that, but he, yeah, he does give a very interesting account of Augustine, yeah, yeah, right? really. The, the, the Augustine, as the inventor of a kind of intellectualism, a kind of interiority, a kind of legalism, which are all the enemies of the ecclesial event, right which cannot be understand, understood in legal metaphors, mm -hmm. which is not available within, but without, amongst, mm -hmm. between, mm -hmm. um, and intellectu intellectuality, which is producing dogmatic statements and generally objectifying the ecclesial event which it cannot be objectified because it it's not an object. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, the book is just rich, a rich mine on this subject of objectivity, right? Which, I'm just tickled which, again. Yeah. Which isn't just objectivity as far as understanding the church goes. I mean, in the media milieu in which I operated all my life, and I've just just finished a book about the cbc which is coming out in the spring the canadian broadcasting corporation mm -hmm. um which in difficult times like the present when there seems to be a lot of when new media produce a chaotic information environment which certainly is the case <laughs> they're they're my old colleagues are very much thrown back in a, in I think a reactionary way on the discourses of let's say objectivity, right? Hmm. We're hmm. going to be objective. Um, these people are in the grips of misinformation, so we need to restore science, objectivity, get back to the tried hmm. and true. But what you're getting back to is exactly what we should be getting over, right? Wow. Yep, which yep, makes, yep. I follow totally. I didn't see this going there, but yeah, 100%. Which makes it very complicated, but mm -hmm. but Yanaris is 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 dealing with in, in the church context, right? That the that the Eucharist as something that I consume for my benefit rather than a symbolic meal that I eat with others in order to experience my community, I wish I had a better word, with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I even experienced that until uh, after I met Ivan. And we would take mass together in, in outdoor settings or in a, a room off the rectory or something, somewhere where I wasn't in church mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to compose my face and you know, not in church. Interesting. Not in yeah. church. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Then mm -hmm. it became real that we were 
eating this celebratory meal in memory of our Lord together came real for me. Yeah. And not just in memory of our Lord, but in fellowship. Right. So, um, yeah, so that he, he has a lot of rich material on ob objectific objectification, on objectivity, yeah, yeah. on the idea that this is a, a magic bread. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if I don't get the magic from the bread, there's something wrong with me, right? Yep. There's something I don't, I'm not, I don't have enough mm -hmm. faith or I don't have enough, you know, it, it, it wasn't. The freeing part of that is to understand, is is to get out, get out of religion, and say, "Well, this is something that can happen between me and anyone, any time." It doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we don't want to, in a modest way, ritualize it or in a remember it or or name it. But we should name it, especially at the moment, very, very cautiously. I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because and premature, our friend Michael's premature naming just leads to premature, like the the greatest gift of our time is to live is is the invitation to live in uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, so. that's a different way of framing it, you know. And again, kind of unpacking it in some language that some of our listeners would hear and inviting your comments, David, a few things. One is, um, yeah, on Augustine. So we're, we're going to a lot of people who love Augustine. We do too. But Yonaros uh, to me does two things. One is he sees these tendencies, as you state so well, um, towards a um, kind of a legal, um, a transactional, you could also say, I think, um, view of some of it. And yet in Yonaros, it's what the Franks did with Augustine that's the bigger story. You know, that they really, yes. he's going to say they juiced it. And um, something interesting I did a few weeks ago is I, I, I might have been online and I saw some people really kind of still flipping out about Pope Francis and the Pachamama thing from about a year and a half ago. After the synod in the Amazon, there was this kind of feminine, it was an indigenous feminine deity that was brought to the Vatican. And uh, okay. and I was reading Yonaros and I was thinking, welcome, Michael. He, Michael signing on. Where is he? Hey. Yeah, you'll see him. Yeah. All right. I was reading Yonaros and uh, and I saw some people online and I forget the context, but they were kind of flipping out on uh, probably two years later, Pope Francis for doing this. So it was and I work for um, I run migrant ministry in my diocese and things like that. And so I'm pretty OK with some indigenous elements. Anyhow, AI is an interesting thing. So I just asked AI, you know, so they don't like a tribal entity, in the Amazon bringing their um there are parts to a liturgy, but I, I was thinking of Yonaros and the Franks. So I said to AI, I said, what parts of the Roman rite did the Franks bring to it? And AI spits back all those individualizing and um, all those individualizing prayers. Isn't that fascinating? You yeah. know, that the Franks brought it. And um, and I thought, so, you know, there's, there's indigenous elements in the Roman rite already. They happen to be Frankish. They happen to be those ones that Yanaros would say they armor the ego, right? They And that's useful language, the armoring of the ego. Whereas, and I'm going to kind of jump a little bit, but some of our listeners have read uh, the great Eastern Orthodox theologian, John Zazulis. And in the larger corpus of Yanaros, Zazulis has a huge role because some of what we're talking about with the ego, the armoring of the ego and the ecclesial event is that distinction um, Zazulis and others make between the individual um, who's kind of the armored ego, the individual who looks at the world and says, Mike's dressing this way, Michael's dressing this way, I'm going to dress this way and be different versus personhood, which is when David Cayley steps into the future, creating it. Um, and becomes who God wanted you to be since before you were born, stepping into your royal clothes. Personhood versus individualism lines up pretty well with the religionization. It's all about the individual. It armors the ego in many cases. And I'm going to say not all these behaviors, you know, the pater noster or, or or making the sign of the cross or or telling your beads, they can be good. But beyond 
beyond critical mass were used in the wrong way. They can kind of work against the ecclesial event, against the development of personhood by, um, you know, through the religionization by kind of hypertrophy. And that's all individual versus person. And that's, you know, some of our listeners are listening different ways. Michael Martin, all right, do you feel like you're connected? Can you hear us? I can hear you finally. I don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> At first, I saw two of you signing on, and then uh, there's two of your blocks and everything. Um, I don't even know. Yeah, so you know, David, we're talking about this guy. Um, a little background is I had sent, you've heard me mention the name, Michael, a book by this Christo Shinaros, who mm -hmm. always felt like it was kind of the yin to Illich's yang to me. And I knew I had to talk to David Cayley about him. So I, I said, you might try him out, but it was just casting a leaf upon the water. And David Cayley signed on and we hadn't pre-gamed or talk. And he's saying like, he really, 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 really likes this guy. And uh, the thing, Michael, is this notion and you'll, you know, you're going to have your own access point to it is for Yanaros, you know, David was mentioning um, that Jesus inst instantiated this idea that like, you and me exist in relationship. And the more that Michael Martin surpasses himself in relation, you know, will say that's, you know, uh -huh. that's death defeating death. You die to the individual, right. you die to the ego, you live in relationship and that relationship is eternal. That's eternal. Well, you, you, I, well, you know, you're talking about the religionization of the religion, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you ever see the movie, uh, what about Bob? Yeah, it's great. You know, Oh, the scene when, oh. when Bill Murray is teaching a kid how to dive, right? He, he's got OCD and he's really scrupulous, David, which ties in. We're going to get there. Yeah. This type of behavior yeah. in an anxious world. Yeah, so, religious. Okay. So here's yeah. Bob kind of organically teaching a kid how to dive. And right as he's about to do it, the dad psychotherapist runs out of the house. I'll take it from here. And that's exactly, that's what religious religionization is. That's because those things you're going to talk about the rosary but all those things those were those were folk practices you know the veneration of mary you know di you know the rosary all this other stuff but then the bishops come in and go i'll take it from here right <laughs> <laughs> and, and i that's what happens is they and they kill the organic spirit you know the that institutionalization of it it just i mean it kills the the kind of grass roots thing i was just talking to a couple of friends who they had started this grassroots kind of orthodox church with just prayers at first in maine and they get it going and then then they didn't have a priest they just had visiting priests and then all of a sudden they get a priest and he just you know they start to organize and they suck the joy right out of it and um, I think we're going to nuance this too, because I, I know that wasn't very nuanced, but that's hard. No, 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 but no, but it's the um, <laughs> and this isn't this isn't about like you know we're using kind of Yanaros and Illich, but it's like my relationship, you know, and Michael's relationship that you know the, the the ordo the ordo can still be a good thing, you know, and you know it's not an either or, and I don't hear you saying it's an either or, Michael. But last night I was watching a um a video on. Uh, Ian McGilchrist. That's a name you're familiar with, David? Yes, I read The Master and His Emissary. It's really, it's a tremendous book. You know, and that, I haven't read. Now he has a new two-volume work. I yeah, think, the, uh, the... Which matter, I have not read yet. Yeah, the uh, something about matter. And, um, but, um, you know, the prioritization, it seems to me, again, like, if, you know, Chesterton gets at this, too, where he, I think in What's Wrong with the World, kind of sees the same thing we're talking about, and yet he, and I've quoted him in an article at Front Porch, where he says, and I wish I had the exact quote, because to bring up Chesterton's name and not use his words is a sin. But he said, you know, everybody likes a little gold on their cape, right? But he knows the hypertrophy of that is a disease. Yeah. Like, um, we can all, again, we can celebrate birthdays. This day is more special than other days or Sunday. And then there's a hypertrophy where all of a sudden the tail starts wagging the dog. And for McGilchrist, this could be something like where all of a sudden the priority of left brain thinking over right brain thinking, you know, has a whole train of effects in its wake, mm -hmm. you know, um, these types of things. David, what do you think about, you know, what Michael and I are talking about and like, how do we, you know, we have a lot of people who are going to church and they know some of that order is, is a pretty good thing. Um, I've been looking at it lately through like McGilchrist um, and Michael, you make a good point how the church can come in and kind of take something that was good 
But, you know, how do we, because we're not saying that, you know, Christo Chinaros loved nothing more than, you know, the divine liturgy. Uh, he loved stop. He couldn't be more grateful that there were these roadside churches in Greece that had icons you could pray in front of and things like yeah. that. Right. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, I, I've, you know, as I began with that story for you, I, I've had to live my own situation. You know, I've had to live into my own yeah. situation without feeling that it's everybody's situation or that everyone's on the same time or the same schedule, right? But I do, I, I do think that us that it is broadly true that symbolic languages age, tire, uh, break down. Ossify. Uh, ossify and need to be renewed. And that broadly speaking, we're in that period of renewal. Wow. I mean, some, you know, I, I've one of two of the people I've been reading in the last couple of years since you and I got to know each other are um, Franz Rosenzweig yeah. and uh, Eugene Rosenstock Hussey. Mm -hmm. um, and Rosenstock Hussey particularly has been a huge inspiration to me. But I mean, they they were attracted to this idea of three ages of the church, right? Peter, Paul, John. That's the way my brain works. Uh, and I mean, for Rosenzweig, for example, the, the Johannine age, you know, he'll go so far as to call Goethe the first, Goethe the pagan is the first Christian, he says. Yeah. Well, that's quite a statement. <laughs> and yet you I, see what I he, agree. See what he, <laughs> I knew Michael wasn't going to object. You really see much. what he means, yeah, right? Yeah, I do. That, I do. Well, you know, that, you know what Goethe that, said? That, hmm? Goethe said, uh, I have a Christianity, but it's for my own private use. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Rosenzweig was on to him. Yeah. But... But I mean, another point that is made about this the jo Johannine period is, is its diffuseness, its necessary diffuseness. <laughs> like it can't be an organized church because its destiny is exactly this distribution uh, of the gospel. So if we go back to Illich, Illich says that i mean i'm i'm going to take a, a chance here and simplify but the injunction to preach to all nations mm -hmm. uh which can love it which concludes some of the gospels um is accomplished uh, you know in an underhanded way it's accomplished through what illich calls the mystery of evil drawing on the use of that or the mystery of lawlessness or iniquity in the second letter to the Thessalonians. He takes the phrase, the mysterium iniquitatis from the Vulgate, but he makes it mean the corruption of Christianity. He makes it mean the misunderstanding, right? Mm -hmm. And in that form, the gospel becomes universal in the sense that if if modernity is a consequence unthinkable without the incarnation now that's quite a hypothesis and not all will accept it but i think it was gerard's hypothesis illich's hypothesis numerous other people's hypothesis um then uh then we're encountering christianity in so many different forms mm -hmm. uh and, and and we're we're basically uh so the first thing is to recognize it right, right? is to recognize that the the truth of our situation lies in what we perceive as the past although it may also be the present um mm -hmm. and I don't see how you, when you're dealing with the problem of religion, how you can get around that, right? That it's 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 necessary to recognize what's around you, and then also 
if possible, to unwind that or to wind it up, depending on how you use that metaphor, to try and understand what was the ecclesial event that lies behind in Aris's language, the conspiratio and illicit language, that lies behind this, right? That created this uh, unusual, unprecedented dynamism, right? That was this, we t I, I quoted my friend, the British sociologist of religion, David Martin, uh, Michael, who was also a priest, uh, who says in a book called The Breaking of the Image that the that the the crucifixion, the incarnation is is the is the nuclear explosion of religion. It's it's uh so which is a nice image because you it makes it easier to live in the mushroom mm -hmm. cloud <laughs> and also to 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 this image of dispersion, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of of multiplicity is is there, yeah. Well, multiplicity you, in unity. Go, Michael. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Goethe. I mean, one place you see that kind of attempt at a renewal and a kind of wild Christianity is with the Romantics, the German Romantics in particular, who like Novalis and you know, but all of the you know, the Jena Romantics were trying to reimagine Christianity at their moment. And their, you know, their their patron saint and godfather was Goethe. So so and and but you see that that percolates through history. And I mean it wasn't just them, but you can see that stream um percolating even to today. Yes. There, there's yes. a the wildness. There's a the people hunger for a wild Christianity. You know? You know, ecclesiastes. You know, ecclesiology is okay, but just don't make a religion out of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's quite a mouthful there. Ecclesiology is okay, but don't make a religion out of it. <laughs> I think it's well said. I love it. <laughs> I, I think you better better unpack that a little. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what and, since uh, church church. Can you have a church? What's a church without religion? Well, well that's what Derrida wanted, right? What's the possibility of religion without religion? Religion without religion, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, what's religion without the church? Or I think we well, need a church. I think, you know, I yeah. think often, you know, about like where I live and where you live, you got both of you live. Um, when there were the circuit priests ministering to the native peoples, right? Yes. Was, maybe they might show up once a year, even with a. With black elk, I have a picture of black elk showing a rosary to a little girl on, over my desk, and uh, that's nice. That mm. th there was such a, and, and not just them, but going back to the Middle Ages, the same thing. the 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 church institution had so little power out there, out yes. in the wilds, out amongst the peasantry. I mean, Christianity was a religion of the cities. Right, so it was it was strong in the city. It had the you can say the the bishops had a lot more power in the cities. Well said. But well out said. in the provinces, they didn't know who the bishop was, right? So things um, adapted and grew organically in those environments. Celtic Christianity is a great example of that. Um, you know, it was so far out of the reach of the administrative. Re, you know, administrative hand of the church that it was able to to be Christian. <laughs> yes, yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was an interesting starting point for Illich. Actually, it was, I mean, he and uh, he and a friend had been interested even back in their student days in folk Christianities, um, but when he discovered the Puerto Ricans. Mm -hmm. Of New York, and then went to Puerto Rico. He he also discovered a very different. He discovered a wild Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, as as you nicely called it. So I that, discovered that, it in Mexican Christianity in my own diocese because I run the migrant ministry. Yeah, you know, and that's why I like kind of uh, just to introduce this for the conversation too is the notion of uh, I'm a big fan. You know, I don't know if how it's going to play out, but 
I do see if we use that three stage history, you know, I like it. Um, you know, we talked about McGilchrist. He likes Hegel. I just had a bug on my screen. He likes Hegel for exactly that reason, right? And you see that symphonic original harmony, discord, higher harmony. Um, you know, we see that in symphonic music. We see that in in the greatest uh, plays, I think, in novels and so forth. Anyhow, like where I see the Holy Spirit working in this in the church, and it's probably fighting fighting its way up, would be um, synodality, to be honest with you. I think Pope Francis intuits some of this, and he's desperately trying to kind of rewild. That's why I mentioned this Pachamama statue, the indigenous elements. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, it goes beyond the church as she, to use Illich's language. But I think that's yep, still an ahead. example of... Go ahead, yep. That's still an example of the bishop trying to take control, right? You know, I, disagree. I got it from here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I just don't know how you can do it in this day and age with when, you know, where the Pope issues a proclamation and within 15 minutes, it's been read all over the earth where, uh, you know, it's just, you know, that kind of uh, um, institutional reach is at odds with, a wild or organic Christianity. And I, I think they're incompatible. I think, I don't think they're incompatible. I would, the poetry, because we said, you know, we could go from, if we're going to use this kind of three-stage heuristic, you could go from multiplicity to kind of unity to multiplicity again. But the real way to follow this is multiplicity in unity. And I'm not saying the Roman Catholic Church, but something, you know, sacramental, I would say. But, um, you know, kicking it back to the peripheries and yes, in a more humble way, kind of articulating that aspect that we all have in common, the one communion, the one church. So if if Bonhoeffer said a religionless Christianity, that's a that's a religionless religion. So boom, we set that aside a little bit, although we see the intuition he had. But I still like the role of church, because church is one and many at the same time. You know, uh, a friend of mine who was a mentor to me, uh, pre-existed me in my job, he was a, a Spiritan, um, went to Duquesne phenomenology, spent time in um, Cameroon, you know, and th this notion, again, when we think of uh, um, what Illich saw in the Puerto Rican Christianity, what I'm seeing in Mexican Christianity, the the lovely, the aspect that every South American country has their own manifestation. They all love Our Lady of Guadalupe in some way, but also they all have their own Marian image, you know, and that there's this, I can, I just see this plurality in unity which can correspond with, you know, or how would we start to describe this unity? It's the one bread, one body is something we might all but, agree in. What do you yeah. say? Yeah. Well, it's like the movie, you know, the mission, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, the problem with the institutional church, especially with Francis in particular, I think, mm -hmm. is what Guido writes about in Empire and Church, right? And she, there, there are too many political actors getting involved in that institution, right. just like we've seen in you know American and Canadian governments, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it infiltrate that that kind of network of evil just infiltrates everything, and it's it's I just you know I think I don't I don't see how. <laughs> see how Christianity is going to survive that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, mean? I really don't. I really don't. The well, church, the, the synod, like the synod working documents, they're saying kind of bold things. I've had to spend a lot of time with what came out of the synod, but it's really bold on, really bold on East and West. And again, I think every, the institution is going to protect itself. But we also see two things, it, it, that the institutional desire to protect itself and the fact that everything seems to be in turmoil now from the bottom up, things breaking from the bottom up and falling apart. I agree. Well, I don't, I I mean, I, I barely understand what's going on in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, mm. And, but I, I think the term church is indispensable, Mike. I agree with you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think to use my image of unwinding, everything that is commonly talked about, right? People will say in our society that they they live in a mental construct called a society. Mm -hmm. it, they wouldn't live in such a thing if there hadn't been a church, right? Mm -hmm. Say a little bit more about that, please, David. 
um, unpack that a little bit. Well, since I'm speaking to Americans, we the people, uh, how can we the people make a state? Well, it's the ecclesial <laughs> event in, in, down the road. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. it's it's um it's it's an implication of what begins uh, there, and um, so I I mean, whatever church turns out to be, we we, we will continue to form churches. You know, to form well, yeah. ch churches, yeah. 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 Uh, and and they will be, and those will be the communities in which we can experience, yeah, this passing beyond ourselves and and into others, and it's a way of understanding how we can be in and with and for others, um, at any moment. So yeah, but that's I think in, in your image of wildness. Yeah, and I and I think and it isn't necessary. It doesn't necessarily look like a church. No, and that and was it. Next, you should try this. I mean, I have done this because you know, kind of my basic philosophical posture is <laughs> what does what do you mean by that word? Right, coming to terms, and it's interesting. I've been on all these podcasts and things and. People say the church, the church. And I say, okay, what do you mean by that word? The yeah. church. And that's one of those terms that falls apart upon the attempt to explain what you mean by it. You know, and, you know, so very, very often, I mean, you know, when Protestants talk about the church, they have a very different idea from what Catholics, I think. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's what I'm saying. Some of these distinctions are super important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's and even I, I don't want to go even farther, but I had a <laughs> guy, guy interviewed me because he saw me post something on Twitter about people don't know the difference between the soul and the spirit because they don't. You ask, somebody, ask a theologian to define them and they can't do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, uh, but it's it's those things, those kind of glittering generalities that we use all the time, but we don't really know what they mean. We think we know what they mean. Right. But well, I like your idea, what you're talking about, which is where I think the church lives. It's like it's almost a Protestant notion of, the, of uh, a temple not built with hands where the parish. That were that 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 uh, instantiation of what we, what you could call the church, which I don't even think is the church, but that, that's, um, that's where, where, whatever that is can, can, not that it does, but can come alive. Right. Well, I mean, Illich, who was my pole star and probably enabled me to think about these things and, probably in the sense that faith's primary meaning is trust, mm. uh, was the person I trusted and probably couldn't have got to where I got without trusting him, right? So he was my bridge, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, but he, from the early time, um, from beating the Puerto Ricans and finding these different styles of Christianity, but also then in his missiology and later in his whole pursuit of the idea of a new church, as he as he called it, um, he always made a, a distinction uh, that there were always two, uh, two churches. There was the the church as she, as he put it, right? Mm -hmm. The 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 event, the ecclesial event that can happen. And then there's the sociological institution, right? Which will behave according to sociological laws. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we have to understand the difference. And he he was pretty scrupulous about the, di the difference. So when he went to Puerto Rico as the head of the, as the vice rector of the Catholic University in Ponce, 
he he refused to behave as a priest because he said he was in a political role and that that would cause confusion. But he, he bought a little hut way off in the far coast where he would sometimes go and serve to, uh, uh, serve mass to the fishermen there because they didn't know who he was and they didn't have anything to do with the university or all the political involvements mm -hmm. of it. So, so you could call that know the difference. And I've never been able to get beyond the idea that that's the most important thing to know the difference, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to know what can be done in the world and what can't be done in the world, but can only be hoped for, prayed for, waited for, experienced in the world, but can never be reliably done, can never be objectified, can never be made a possession of ours, because right? it's not in our power. Uh, and that's the fundamental uh, difference for me, right? So, mm -hmm. but we we live in the world in which everything can be done because we institutionalized the gospel. We institutionalized the incarnation. We we in effect said we could have it all. We could take it all, and we could put it into we could put it into action. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what Charles Taylor says the the reform master narrative was in a secular age. It's we can all become real Christians. We can we can realize this thing, right? And we're now, I mean, we're realizing it with a vengeance now. <laughs> uh and it's realizing us. I mean, it's it's um yeah. But I still think the, the thing to understand is the difference. If, if you want to stop it, you have to understand <laughs> the difference. Mm -hmm. That's that's the, the key matter. And then and that the church. So we can't make churches, but churches can be made. Uh, and we can participate in that. Right, because we can experience mm -hmm. the ecclesial event pretty much anytime, anywhere. Uh, but we can't take control of it. No. Mm -hmm. So th that would be the thing I would want to say. Yeah. Yeah, you know this book, Mike. Right, you can't see it. The Catholic thing. She's great, Rosemary um, Hunt. And that's her. What her? She. She. That's kind of her argument is that you have these two things. You have. You know, she, the church. Yeah. But you also have Sophia, who she says, she she obliged them to think Sophia. It was, it was certainly the influence of the unpredictable Sophia to which they were subjected. She obliged them to think some new and outrageous thoughts. And this is certainly her chapter. But again, it will be clear. She does not work alone. Right? Yeah. So, but you, so you need that, the wildness to to keep the institution from becoming petrified. Right. That's, that's what Hutton's arguing, right? And I'm loving the feminine that you brought up the feminine because this kind of gets me going in, in a wonderful way because if we're talking again, maybe about this three-stage movement, you know, from the feminine to the masculine to something now in our time, which corresponds to the Joanine church maybe, but the, you know, the masculine and feminine combined is this Marian element for me, which is tied only speaking for myself, tied to the local. As I mentioned, all these throughout these indigenous in, influenced expressions of Catholicism throughout all the Latin American countries, you know, they all have their local Marian patroness, this whole yes. continent, America is dedicated to the immaculate conception. And this whole continent is dedicated to our lady of Guadalupe. The church that's dying in this time in America is a Western European Charlemagnean Frankish implant, right? That the American land is just kind of puffing up and that hopefully what replaces it, you know, and I just love that image of Sophia because, you know, I've said it before on the podcast, some of this mystery about Marian apparitions taking place at solar noon for that particular location, Mary speaking in the patois 
of the language at La Salette. She spoke to Maximum and Melanie in the the local patois that was only in that one, you know, and Illich would love this stuff, yeah. you know, where each valley was gendered. You know, David's capturing the resonances here, you know, and at that type of church, uh, just so grateful you brought up Rosemary Houghton because the tutelary spirit of this time is my kids just watch uh, my son was over with his wife and I met my, for the second time, my newest grandson, my only grandson, James Courage, but they were watching The Wizard of Oz last night. And um, I had used in a series of three articles on the future of religion at Front Porch Republic, Dorothy on the American landmass in Frank Baum's words, which aren't antithetical to the movie, but she was just really this wonderful spirit, Dorothy, you know, and, um, you know, we see this, uh, she's a distinctly American creation. And I'm yeah. just loving, I'm just loving that, like, this landmass from the Arctic Circle to Tierra del Fuego, you know, we might be coming into our own with the divine feminine and these local churches, local culture, local patois, things like that. David, what are you hearing? You know, Well, I'm hoping you guys are going to get over thinking yourselves, thinking of yourselves as the only Americans soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Because that's a that's a huge, it's I think, a stumbling block in American consciousness. Wow, is, well said. Well said. Is um, the the, the counter revolutionary Tories from whom I'm descended, who fled the Republic uh, in what? 1783, uh, were Americans, and they established another American country. In Canada, mm -hmm. um, and um, so you know the idea that this that the United States is not the United States of America, and there are other con American countries, but that this is America. So whenever I hear, whenever I hear, I'm I'm allergic to that word. Yeah, America, that happens. America. I was thinking about this because the, the, the myth is the myth of no. of the special ones is present as soon as the word is spoken. Well, it's, it's also semantic because what are you going to call them then? United Statesians? <laughs> we well, think... it's true. It's true. If mean... you, uh, you, the word wouldn't bother me if the consciousness of... No, I get that, yeah. Uh, yeah. ...wasn't there, right? If, yeah. if the chosen people wasn't being reproduced at a time when chosenness is the thing we need to be questioning, right? Mm -hmm. But I, at least I would also say this, I think about this a lot, that uh, with Canada and the United States, I don't want to speak on behalf of Latin America because I don't have any yeah. experience, with it, but I do have North America. Um, that, uh, you know, we have, if you think about it, the if you compare, I'm going to say American meaning American and Canadian, uh, Christianity is about this deep. Whereas European Christianity is this deep. Yeah, okay. Um, my house is 160 years old, which is like a, it's a it's a newer newer model in England. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, but I th think just kind of culturally, and I think this is what you guys were saying is that we still haven't even become peoples in a way. It's still at this kind of superficial cultural level that hasn't doesn't really have roots yet. I mean, it's only a couple hundred, a few hundred years old. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know the way that we have those. Uh, it's interesting if you look, and I'm sure it's the same place in Toronto, same way in Toronto, but in in Detroit where I grew up, there's well, there's the Native American layer, right? Oh. So there's a lot of names, but then after that, the French came in. So there's a lot of French names in downtown yeah. Detroit. And then the farther you get out from downtown, the, the French names change to English, right. right? So you have all these layers, uh, but but still uh, but still not settled in a way. So so I think even Ralph Steiner said the the uh, the, the American meaning North American uh, epoch is still far ahead because it needs time to. To grow roots in a way. Well, I'm I'm picturing old Robert Frost with his wispy white hair at the, at the Kennedy um, mm -hmm. inauguration, John Kennedy's inauguration, reading his 
poem and his text blew away. I remember this as a boy. But the poem he read and includes the line, the land was ours before we were the lands. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think Michael's saying that it's that's still the case. It's still I think case. so. I think, yeah. <laughs> 60 years later. Mm -hmm. I think one of the aspects that relates is that, um, and I, I've, I've mentioned this on the podcast too, and I don't mean it to be like a fetishized notion of blood, is that um, the, you know, I read that 85% or 84% of Mexicans have indigenous blood. This is not true of the United States. And it's no. not true of the Catholic Church in the United States. And I think the Catholic Church in the United States is somewhat hampered for that. You know, so Michael, you're 100% right. It's going to take time. But also, it's almost like um, some elements in North America have repressed it, you know, and we've got to stop doing that. We're keeping out, uh, you know, it's almost like we have a studiously avoided um, a real relationship with the land. That's why people like Wendell Berry can be such. Um, and by the way, David Cayley is the Wendell Berry of Canada. It's my moniker for him. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know that we're and we and we see this hunger in young people, young Anglo's, um, to to try to connect with their local piece of land. And this is, you know, this is a great Catholic thing. This is a great, uh, yeah. And again, I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to baptize it for the Roman Catholic Church. All right. What do you say, David? How about this? Uh, you know, David, there's so much here. I'm gonna say a few things. Because um, I want you to tell us about, you know, your book on the CBC. You know, we're nearing kind of uh, bringing some stuff together here is uh, I'm not so old. And Michael, I know you've had people on the podcast that you kind of fanboy on a little bit. But uh, through his through his work at the CBC, you know, that's how I really got to know Simone Weil. Then I read her. It's how I got to know uh, William Kavanaugh. Then I read him. It's so many people. Now, and did, the, Mike, yeah, Mike, Mike, yeah. yep. did you guys get the CBC growing up? Were you able to hear it? I don't know how I got introduced. No, I got Illich's book, Rivers North of the Future, that I stalked okay. David Cayley like it was my job. But okay. the... Because um, we could actually hear it in Detroit. Oh, yeah. And I probably could. You know, we had some... My dad had cool radios and stuff. But the fact that I sent David... I recommended a, an author to David, you know, who's taught me so much. And he began this podcast, Michael, by... You know, he was always going to be a gentleman and read it and, you know, be able to uh, be an intelligent interlocutor with it. But uh, the fact that you were very impressed by it, and I think I did you a service by recommending this person, uh, none of us none of us are foreign to that feeling. So thank you for giving me that feeling, well, David Cayley. Yeah. Ju just to say a little bit about that, Mike, is, I mean, when Illich uh, dropped the matter of Rivers North of the Future on me, mm -hmm. I was not, I mean, I didn't, I couldn't say anything when he said uh, that I'm somewhat alone in feeling this way, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was only after he died, really, that I began to see all the resonances of what he was saying. This, so the phrase, corruptio optimi pessima, which, in which he summed up his idea, you know, I was surprised to find it at the conclusion of John Milbank's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what was his great yeah, Social part? theory. Uh, uh, theology and social theory. Theology and social theory. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then, you know, on and on and on. There, were, there would be this author, that author, that where I would, uh, uh, Harold Berman's uh, uh book law and revolution you know there are numerous other examples yeah. charles taylor then thinking well you know this is going this is going along the very lines i'm working along mm -hmm. but i've i've not come across any author who i think is closer to what illich is trying to convey than leonaris victory hey so, friends of mine yeah, yeah and i think religionization is exactly Corruption, yeah. corruptio, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and it's a very very fruitful theme, and it's very very boldly treated. I yeah. think. I mean, to have the word totalitarian introduced, for example, Yanaris yeah, yeah. says the church, the 
is the first totalitarian institution. I mean, that's a bold statement. Mm -hmm. And and again, a, a, a major inducement to try to start thinking this thought in what in what way is is modernity a dis a displacement of what begins in the Roman Church mm -hmm. and and the Church according to Ionaris, who's not who doesn't purvey the myth of the un of the of the unchanged Orthodox Church, right? Yeah. He he's he's quite savage on the myth of orthodoxy, actually, or orthodox he is, great. That's orthodoxism, as he calls it. He yeah, says yeah. that it's not. Isn't that it's great, not, Michael? Orthodoxism. It's no, it's, not, it's what my friends in Maine were experiencing, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Exactly. One of them, actually, the artist who did the cover art for the not the Divine Feminine for the the household of things issue of the Jesus imagination she okay, got yeah. communicated by the priest. <laughs> she didn't know. Nobody told her. That's nice. Yeah, orthodoxism. Yeah. Another well, point yeah, Mike, go ahead. What, yeah. was just to finish here is, is um, there's a chapter in the rivers of the future called the gospel and the gaze. Mm -hmm. And which was the fruit of Illich's late reflection on the, uh, sensory life um and particularly the cult of images and so on right and and it, he's um, which became a crisis uh in the in the church after the beginning of islam really and you know the i uh, there was civil war between the iconoclasts and the mm -hmm. icono duels i mean it was mm -hmm. it literally came to war a couple of times and the, the issue was settled at the council, um, in the second Nicene Council. And according to the teaching of, of John of Damascus, who was then dead for some years, but, you know, and Ivan expounded that, right? So the, the idea of an icon, the, the, the legitimacy of an icon is that it points. Mm -hmm to the to an to a reality to the reality in heaven if you like point yeah, the type yeah. points to the prototype mm -hmm. well Unaris has a whole theory about signs right yep, yep the understanding of signs as as being absolutely different than a religious apprehension of miracles or all or or objects of any fetish objects of any kind right mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's always the understanding that this is a sign. Yeah, yeah. That it's pointing beyond, beyond itself, and yep. so it, what Ivan says is that the Church in the West does not accept the teaching of the Council, but instead moves into a whole pedagogy, right? Uh, the the whole, um, in a certain way. The whole origins of modern art lie in a in 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 a different in a theory of representation. Um, right, is, and, which, and the is, debates out over which 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 eliminates yep, yep, yep. the otherness from the things of the world. Their their significance. Yep. Uh, and so it's it's it was rich to read that and to think. Yeah. He's he'll say in the West exactly say, the yeah. same way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He'll say the uh, Unaris will say in the West the the problem was that uh, we started believing that the signified was captured by the signifier, right? And Unaris has a completely different understanding of apophatism. You know, where we yes. would just say apophatism is to say God is love is to kind of lie because God is so much more than love. He's just going to say apophatic language is just all that language, all of it. Yes. Where we don't claim that the signifier captures the signified, that by calling Bonnie's name that you've captured the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, Charles Williams gets at this. Another, um, not for just a, I'm rereading Charles Williams' book, The Descent of the Dove, you know, and that's where he uses as his whole hermeneutic that this no, this mystical notion, this is thou, this is also not thou. Same thing, folks. 
And Charles Williams, yeah, you might enjoy rereading his Descent of the Dove. I never he, read he knows it. we got I away from that. It. Oh, yeah, he we got away from that, and we're called Thames Three Stage Thing. We got away from that. We ossified the world, and we're going to rejoin at a higher level, which he calls the return to manhood, right? Because we're not slavish anymore. We're not slavish. Yeah. We step into our own. Um, how about this? Let's uh, let's talk about apophatism. You'll come on again in the next two months or something, wouldn't you, David, to kind of continue this? Sure. All right. No, we might do another talking, one. I love talking to you too. So <laughs> tell, us is, what, tell us about your book with the CBC. Cause again, this is it's such a great <clears> podcast. All right. But, uh, all right. Yeah. So th this is a lifelong preoccupation. I, mm -hmm. I worked at the CBC for more than 40 years. Um, it's, I think in my time, went from a populist revolt against the first style of the CBC, which the populace considered to be elitist, which was a kind of adult education model of public broadcasting, if you want, mm -hmm. right? It was a it was an edifying model of public broadcasting. It had it had its popular side. Uh, it wasn't that pretentious, but it for the populace of the 60s, it was, and you know, we got to get, we've got this exciting new medium, television, we got to really get with the people here. Okay. Um, and that was the populist era. And I, my argument is that it's ended in a new elitism. So oh, the, C the CBC of... is now, to use the current shorthand, fully woke. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a again, fully yeah. it's a fully woke and virtually unanimous organization so to take a, a small example when the when a new populist revolt broke out and the, the truckers invaded truckers. ottawa in the and mm -hmm. in the in 2022 and oh, those truckers oh, and yeah. and were clearly an eruption from Canada's political unconscious. I mean, the bridges were thronged with people, the parking lots as they, as these, as this convoy of trucks approached Ottawa, if, you know, it was, it was pretty easy to recognize wide popular support. Um, whether it's the 50% of your countrymen that have now endorsed Donald or electors that have endorsed Donald Trump. It was a lot. It was big. Mm -hmm. The CBC didn't want to have anything to do with these people. Right. The night they arrived, they interviewed a guy who was against it, in who was in North Dakota. <laughs> and they didn't <laughs> talk to a single person <laughs> who had come. And yeah. when it was over, they summed it up as a, a security problem. Uh, what an embarrassment. A, a, a misinformation problem. Like they did not understand their task as public broadcasters mm -hmm. to go out and interrogate and maybe even enliven this phenomenon, bring it into conversation, right? So they're fully committed to keeping the country as polarized as possible and to keeping the what you will hear on the CBC to one wow. Wow. opinion, one correct opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Could you change the letter CBC so, to NPR and write the same absolutely. novel? I mean, book. Yeah, oh, well, I don't sense. know that, but I suspect so from yes. what I hear. <laughs> but <laughs> we know so, we'll answer it for you. Yes. So. so the book is a history. How did this happen? And a plea for a new era. Um, wow. Of, right. of a of a place of, of basing myself on the idea that Canada desperately needs a public forum right which is a place to question a place to think a place to talk um and no yeah, that's that's the argument yeah. so so whether yeah, yeah. you know it's 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 a book that's not it's, it hasn't got a plan right because there can't be a plan until the problem is recognized but i'm wow. hoping it will it will plant a standard and at least that some people will recognize mm -hmm. this position as trans-political. 
that I'm I'm not a partisan, right? Mm -hmm. um, that I'm, I'm that I believe that our whole modernity has broken down and turned into a babel of of, of tongues that no one seems to be able to interpret, and that so that's an exciting prospect in certain ways if you're interested in conversation mm -hmm. there should be mm -hmm. let's talk there should be a place to talk right and it, sh it has to be uh, a negative space a hypothetical space mm -hmm. a free space uh i i don't have very good words for what the character of that space should be but it it should be a new a kind of public sphere and the cbc is uh, empowered by law to try and do that, so it, that that's what it should do. So that's the book. Nice. Now that's because Mike mentioned NPR. I would say NPR and PBS in this country. Sure. They've always been present, but they have, uh, and except for NPR over the last couple of decades, but PBS. I mean, they have had. Um, they were not the centerpiece of electronic media like the yeah. C CBC it was in Canada, or like the BBC. Well, the CBC wasn't in Canada a lot of the time. So after 1958, when American media, uh, when, when American television began to penetrate oh, Canada, okay. uh, and a second private network was, I mean, the United States could always produce snazzier more attractive entertainments on in general than the, than we could Did so they uh, as soon as the ctv to... network <laughs> pervade american television to canadians they basically in you know, on the whole prefer <laughs> preferred american television yeah, so right, the right, cbc right. has has been a guest in its own country for a long time, oh, that's and it, and it been in a very difficult position. I don't want to minimize that. Yeah. I was raised on 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 Canadian broad the Canadian Broadcasting Company Children's Television as a child. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. good stuff. The, the friendly giant and Mr. Yeah, Dressup. Huh. yeah. Mr. Dressup. So you were you're a that's you my know. era. All right, that's great. <laughs> Well, David and Michael, that and David, that sounds like a real cri de core. You know, having worked at the CBC, telling that story, all of our listeners will. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be so. Um, I thought, you know, it, it might just be like you were just going to write the history, but it, clearly, um, it, that's not something we can link to yet. No, it will be published in the spring. Okay, and we'll we'll talk about that. We'll talk. Uh, we're, I want to continue. Let's let's talk about let's continue this kind of conversation with about you know apophatism and some of this stuff. Um, you know, in the near future. Well, I think that's a very rich theme. And it actually, yeah. I'll say one more thing about the yeah, CBC yeah. book, because, you know, after I finished the Illich book, I, I wrote this thing and it took me two years to write it. And now it's taken me two years to unwrite it because it was about 200,000 words and it, yeah. it was way too philosophical. And so I, and, you know, I'm not finished yet. I'm waiting for the publisher to okay. send me some more revisions, um, which, is, again, is cutting out exposition. But, but, and there are various branches of that. But one is media theory, right? Mm -hmm. that, that I want to argue that the, it's time for a responsible practice of media. Mm -hmm. Wow. Which now... The CBC, in historically, overlooks the fact that it's a media, right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 Canada lives here. It's all the news. It's you know it's the news you need. There isn't any. Nobody's going to say, well, "Wait a minute, what's news?" Right? How do you yeah. how do you, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you, how do you make a world appear? And then claim that's the only world. And not only right. that, but you know it objectively. Wow. That's quite, feat. that's quite a feat. Yeah. So, but that's not, that's barely on the agenda yet. But I think the, the media explosion, right? Mm -hmm. In my, I mean, in the last 20 years, every person yeah. is a is a broadcaster. Yeah, right, right. Every, 
every cell phone, every smartphone is a broadcasting tower. Mm. That's amazing. Then, then that's gonna that's that's producing a a crisis. Word is overused, right? It's producing a, a a saturation and a, and a degeneration in a certain way, which which is asking for this kind of self-consciousness, right? Yeah, but right. when you start to get into media theory, that this is mediated communication, it doesn't just stop with what's between me and the CBC that they're not mentioning. It's, it's the whole idea of mediation, right? Mm -hmm. yep, yep. So if you go back then to Yanaris, the sign, right, that points beyond itself, right? It's it's a questioning and an acknowledgement of mediation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That now we see through a glass darkly. Wow, wow, wow. Way that to weave these we, threads now together. Now we know yeah. in part, right? Mm -hmm. And and if I could convince my colleagues that they know in part, I would have <laughs> my old yeah. I would have succeeded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they are within a myth still and are trying to reinforce and desperately shore up that myth that mm -hmm. they know in whole. Mm -hmm. Because well, they wow. know objectively, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting to say that because, you know, part of the, with the, the aftermath of the American, the United States ele election <laughs> is that uh, what, what, cha what changed this election from 2020 and 2016 is now because of the independent media whether it's on X yeah, or Twitter, yeah. that was able to subvert or reach people around what used to be the only media that they could get to, which, and it's interesting if you mentioned the C CBC, but also NPR also they're a, uh, they have one register, they have one, one thought and they have one agenda they're promoting. And the same criticism arises of the yeah. BBC, right? Yeah. But no, it was an, it was a very <laughs> impressive result yeah in 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 very in a number of ways and but, and you noticed also during the the truckers protest basically the cbc was mouthing government talking points yes yeah and, and which yep, yep, yep. that used to that's um antithetical to the to the role of journalism right yes i i don't think there is much journalism in that sense mm -hmm. uh except you can still investigate approved. There's in, there will be investigated investigative journalism of approved targets okay. of investigation. Well, but of there won't targets. be investigative journalism of disapproved mm -hmm. targets. Yeah, and I think that that's reinforced by a powerful, powerful enemy psychology. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that is it's too dangerous to think now. Because, you know, uh, you just think the opposite thought of your enemy, right? Mm -hmm. If Donald Trump says hydrochloroquine is a, is a, might be a beneficial drug against COVID, you immediately say... It must be poison. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Donald yeah, Trump yeah, said yeah. that it can't be right. right? Crazy times. You, know, you, you stop thinking. I mean, I'm just taking an example out of the no. air. but yeah. uh, Well, again, I've got a... I'm going to head down. I'm sure you're going to have a, a, a great Thanksgiving, Michael. We have a pre-Thanksgiving going on downstairs. and um, Really? Yeah. The, it's kind of uh, families in town, and I think they're enjoying my wife's famous chili. And uh, But Ooh. I wish you... I wish uh, I could come. Yeah, I wish all of our <laughs> listeners, I wish our Canadians... It's only about a four-hour drive. <laughs> We're still going to get you down here, and you're going to... I'm going to come and see you. Okay, I promise. Yeah. We got I the Abby the Genesee. We got Michael Martin. But I, I have... I, I lived in the States as a boy. We, yeah. we emigrated to New Hampshire mm -hmm. when I was 11. Well, you've got I plenty of places very, to stay. I have very fond memories of American Thanksgiving. Great, 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 great. Okay. Well, we wish but, all of our listeners a... A wonderful Thanksgiving, too. Yes, and, and me too. Uh, yeah, and we're going to see our friend David Cayley again, and we're going to be back soon. Um, Tara Thiki, we're going to have her on again, Michael. And I know yeah. you've had some correspondence with her, David. Yes, she's we gonna... have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's great. She's really yeah. great. So yeah. uh, thanks for great. listening to the Regeneration Podcast, all. And we'll see you again.